What's up guys, Dr. Gooden back with another video, this time about principles of test selection and administration. I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, professor of kinesiology at Point Loma Nazarene University. And in this video, we'll be talking about chapter 12, principles of test selection and administration. And specifically in this video, we'll be addressing environmental factors and concerns with test selection and administration that are important for the health and safety of your athletes. And before we can really dive into specific tests of different fitness characteristics and fitness parameters, we have to talk about these health and safety issues first. Now this information comes from chapter 12 of the Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning. Uh, this chapter was written by Dr. Michael McGuigan. Or maybe it's McGuigan, McGuigan? McGuigan sounds better, so we'll go with that. Now, two really important factors to consider are the metabolic energy system and the biomechanical movement patterns found in your sport. And the tests that we choose and employ should really be specific to these two components. Now, it doesn't mean that every test will have the exact metabolic requirements or the exact biomechanical uh, you know, movement patterns and specific kinetic and kinematic uh, characteristics of the sport, but we should carefully consider those characteristics of the sport when we're selecting the tests. So let me explain. We need to consider the energy demand, whether it's phosphagen, glycolytic, um, or oxidative of the sport when choosing to design our fitness tests. So when I say fitness, I mean energy system fitness. So if you have a group of soccer players, right, you might want them to do the yo-yo intermittent recovery test level one if you wanna test their aerobic capacity. But you might have them do the level two, which is uh, faster right out of the gate, to test their anaerobic capacity. Now you probably wouldn't give the yo-yo level one to a group of volleyball athletes because they don't necessarily need that well-developed aerobic system that soccer players need. And in reality, volleyball players do very little straight line sprinting as found even in the yo-yo level two test. So the biomechanical movement pattern specificity is very low for those athletes. And we might want to choose a different volleyball specific test. Another example, you probably wouldn't give a 100 meter sprinter a one mile run test. It's just not specific to his or her event. Yes, maybe the biomechanical uh, movement pattern specificity is sort of there because they're running, but they're not sprinting. And so it's not exactly the same as their event. And plus the metabolic specificity is way outside of the 100 meters. So we just have to keep those things in mind when we are choosing which tests to use for our athletes. So for a test to be valid, it must emulate in some way the energy system requirements and important movements of the sport for which ability is being tested. Now some exceptions to this. Let's say that you want to measure strength in a group of distance runners. Now having these distance runners do an isometric mid thigh pull or a one repetition maximum on the back squat or on the bench press is not specific either to the energy system or to the biomechanical movement patterns in their sport. However, if as a sports scientist and a coach, you've determined that strength is an important characteristic for runners, maybe not necessarily directly for performance, but perhaps it supports some other qualities like power and like power endurance or speed endurance, or maybe even just injury prevention, and you want to test it, well, then it's still a valid test to do for your runners. But just know that you're not measuring direct running performance with a strength test. You're measuring a factor that supports running performance. Now we also have to keep in mind the experience and training status of our athletes, as well as the age and sex. So we have to consider the athlete's ability to perform the correct technique. So if you're doing a one arm back squat with somebody who's never weight trained before, well, maybe you need to change that test or just train them up a little bit before you have them perform a one repetition max. In some cases, a test might not be suited to an athlete because they don't even have the prerequisite strength or endurance to complete that test. Again, to use kind of a silly example, we wouldn't give a shot putter a 1.5 mile run test, A, because it's not relevant to a shot putter at all, and B, they, 
they might not even be able to complete the 1.5 mile test. You know, not to knock shot putters, but they are highly fit for their event, uh, but they're not gonna be prepared to run 1.5 miles without stopping. We also wanna think about the age and sex of our athletes. So, you know, th this could be a whole variety of factors that play into this, but we wouldn't give a group of 10 year old soccer players uh, 1RM max tests in the weight room. We might wanna test their strength a different way. And likewise, we need to be cognizant of various psychological factors that affect each sex differently. So we might not want to put a scale out in the middle of the sports medicine room when we are doing weigh-ins for a female team, just because of the uh, social and peer pressures and stigmas that tend to surround that kind of thing. We, we wanna make it a comfortable testing environment for our athletes. Now, environmental factors also play a big role, especially for the health of the athletes. Things like high temperature and high humidity can not only impair performance, but can also pose a health risk and lower the validity of aerobic endurance tests. Not as much for strength and power tests, but extremely high heat and extremely high humidity might impair those as well. We also wanna think about te temperature fluctuations. For instance, if for your pre-test, for a group of distance runners, you perform a timed mile run on the track at 7 a.m. when it's nice and crisp and cool outside. And then your post-test is at 3 p.m. in the heat of the day, it's 90% humidity. Don't expect that those two testing results will be valid. It's not like comparing apples to apples because the testing conditions were so much different between those two tests. So the key point then is that the athlete's experience, training status, age, and sex can all affect test performance. And we need to consider these factors in the test selection. Also environmental factors such as temperature, humidity, and altitude can influence performance. So we need to try to standardize these as much as possible. Now, when we are administering these tests, we have to be aware of health and safety considerations. This really means being observant of both our athletes and the environment that we are that we are testing in. So we have to be aware of conditions that could potentially threaten our athletes' health, like high heat and humidity. We have to be observant of signs and symptoms of health issues. And we have to be observant of the health status of the athletes, so their health history or any current problems, physical or physiological, that they're struggling with, maybe even psychological. So for instance, if we know that our athletes will be competing or testing aerobically in a high heat, high humidity environment, it's best to follow a few guidelines. First, we wanna make sure that the athletes are well-trained, that they're engaging in some sort of training so they have baseline aerobic fitness to even complete the test. Second, we want to avoid as much as possible testing under these extreme conditions, but sometimes it can't be helped. Like if you live in Arizona or if you live in you know, a Southern latitude or have a track meet that is scheduled for a certain date and it's just a high heat, high humidity type of day. However, we could move these tests indoors if indoor facilities are available. We also wanna make sure that our athletes are acclimated to high heat and high humidity. This is one reason why athletes tend to travel to the location of their competition at least a week or two before that competition takes place, when it's a high stakes or a championship type of competition. We want to ensure proper hydration status. We want to encourage our athletes to continue drinking uh, as they exercise in the heat and make sure that they're wearing breathable, light colored, loose fitting clothing. Now as coaches or sports scientists, we can take all of those precautions and still the worst could happen. Our athletes could have some sort of health issue that we need to quickly identify. So here are some signs and symptoms to look out for if testing or competing in the heat. So cramps, nausea, dizziness, difficulty walking or standing, faintness, garbled speech, lack of sweat, red or ashen skin, goosebumps. If your athlete starts to develop any of these, it's best to call the athletic trainer immediately and get them removed from practice, out of the heat, plenty of fluids, maybe something to eat, and to make sure that medical professionals are taking good care of them. Now, the last thing to go through as far as test administration goes before we talk, start talking about individual tests is how we prepare for testing ahead of time with things like forms to print out for data collection or training the testers, etc. So we have to provide testers 
with practice and training. So you can't just pick any old volunteer off the street to help you out with a testing session for your athletes. They have to be trained first. They have to know how to use the measurement implements that you're using, right? Whether it's a yardstick or a force plate or a 3D motion capture system, you know, whatever it is you're using to measure the ability, the tester has to have some experience and be trained in that ability. We have to ensure consistency among testers. So usually it's best to keep the same person as the tester over multiple tests. So if you have the same two guys or girls testing the 100 meter time of your athletes for their sprint test or maybe 30 meter or 10 meter, whatever it is, you want the same timers every single time. Better yet, use a timing system, eliminate human error, and then rely on the technology as long as it's been validated in the literature. We also wanna make sure we have the appropriate recording forms to increase efficiency and reduce recording errors. So you wanna make sure that you have recording forms with the team roster printed out, the order of athletes correct, and maybe even the athlete's previous best in that test so that you can say, hey, you know, last time you ran, um, you know, a 5.5 for your 40, this time let's get under that. Or last time you jumped, you know, 42 centimeters, let's try to jump higher than that this time. That helps to encourage the athletes, it gives them a frame of reference, and it keeps everyone on track for testing, especially when the athletes are in the order, their names are in the order that they'll come in for testing. We need to consider whether the athletes will be tested all at once or in small groups. Maybe you have them coming in on a rolling schedule, groups of two or groups of three. It really depends on your testing setup. And we need to consider if we will do a testing battery, meaning multiple tests, and whether we will have multiple testing trials. And for the most part, we do want to use multiple trials, especially when the test is not maximally fatiguing. Now, if it is maximally fatiguing, like a, a one RM back squat or in a one mile you know, timed run or in a yo-yo test, then of course we're not gonna do two of those back to back. But in things like very short sprints or in vertical jumps, we definitely want to have multiple trials. We also have to allow sufficient rest between maximal attempts. Now, it's important to standardize what sufficient is because what one athlete might think is enough time, another athlete might not think is enough time. For instance, if you've ever performed strength testing with a more aerobic athlete, they might say that they're ready to go within minutes of completing their strength test or like within a minute. Uh, but what they don't realize is that perhaps their anaerobic systems have not fully recovered but aerobically, they're totally fine. So we wanna make sure that we slow those athletes down and allow sufficient time between maximal effort strength tests. Now, finally, the sequence of tests is very important if, you're, if you are administering a battery of tests. And the sequence is this. We want non-fatiguing tests first. So these tests might be affected by fatigue from other tests, but because they themselves are non-fatiguing, they won't affect subsequent tests by having them first. So any kind of questionnaire or psychological evaluation or taking the height or weight of athletes, these should all be done first. Next, we want agility tests because these require um, short bursts of power and speed and very specific footwork. And so we want those to be done in a non-fatigued state. Next would be maximum power and strength tests. Again, these are very low duration, but they are, they are high effort and they do start to uh, produce fatigue for our athletes. So they should go after the agility tests, but before some of the other longer tests. Sprint tests would come next. And you know, I would argue that sprint tests and max strength and power tests, you might, you might be able to flip those, especially if your sprint test is something like a 20 meter sprint, maybe even a 40 yard dash. We probably wanna do those, um, in my mind, before a maximum back squat. Right, We don't wanna do that max back squat and then feel tight for the sprint test and then pull a hamstring. So I would say, actually, even though it's different than the textbook, sprint tests before the max strength tests, if it's something like a back, back squat. Then next we would go with local muscular endurance tests. And this is because a local muscular endurance test tends to be until failure. So you don't wanna take a muscle group to failure and then go try to do max strength or max speed or agility. That would just be a dangerous situation. So we test those next. And then next we have fatiguing anaerobic capacity tests 
and aerobic capacity tests. Now, both of these you're probably not going to run on the same day, or at the very least, not in the same session. Maybe you have one in the morning and one in the evening, if you have to do both. Very rarely will an athlete uh, go through tests in all of these categories in the same battery. Typically, it'll be you know anywhere between two to four, maybe five tests in a battery, but then you start dragging the testing session on and on and on, and really uh, that's going to be a two, three, four hour ordeal for just an individual athlete to get through all of those. So we want to avoid that when possible. The key point is that the order of tests should be designed in such a way that the completion of one test does not adversely affect performance in the subsequent tests. Now, as we are nearing the time of test administration, you wanna make sure you do all of the following. We need to announce the date and time and the purpose of the testing battery to the team while in advance. Make sure that this is not the first time the athletes have performed these. So host a pre-test practice session or even multiple sessions to make sure the athletes arrive ready for the test, understanding what they are and how to perform them. Make sure you have clear and simple instructions. Make sure that is standardized across all of your testers. Demonstrate and have the athletes perform a proper warm up. We, we want to make sure to tell the athletes their test scores after each trial. This is critical. We want immediate and direct feedback. This is how high you jumped. This is how fast that sprint was. And even better, compare that to previous times for those athletes, or if the athletes um, are on a competitive, uh, you know, sort of team environment with their other comrades on their team, maybe even compare to other athletes. But of course, use your best judgment with that as some athletes thrive in that environment, other athletes that sort of shuts them down to be compared to their peers. And then finally, make sure there's a supervised cool down period. Now that we know the basic principles of testing administration and selection, in the next video, we'll be talking about specific performance and fitness tests that you can use to gauge various parameters of your sport, like strength, speed, power, agility, etc. So stay tuned for the next video, click on over there to keep learning, and I'll see you guys in the next video.